That's most of us. All right, a little business before we get into what we are about this morning. The final exam, and it is not comprehensive if you've looked at your syllabus lately, but the final exam period where we'll be taking our last test is at the ungodly hour of 8.30 in the morning Friday. I can barely get you folks here at 9.30, 8.30. It's going to be a stretch. I don't make that schedule. The university does, and I have to live by it, and so do you. 8.30 Friday. If you pick up one of these sheets that has this stuff listed on it, the entire exam schedule for all courses. You flip it over to the back and there's a bunch of rules and regulations on it that the university has established. The one that I will point out is if you skip the exam, you fail the course. Regardless of what your grade is going up to that final exam, if you're not here at 8.31 when I close the doors, I'll see you or somebody will see you again in this class either in the summer or next fall. It's that simple, so you've been forewarned. During this exam period on Friday, you're going to receive two tests that constitute two separate grades. One will cover bus stop that we've been looking at on video for the last week and we'll continue to discuss this morning, as well as the final lecture textbook exam that covers the physical theater, scenic design, lighting design, and costume design. The chapters that that test covers chapter 3, 9, 10, and 11. 9, 10, and 11 cover scenic design, lighting design, costume design. Chapter 3 covers the physical theater. I'll come back to those guys. But anyway, that's the name of the game. Now, between now and next Friday, tomorrow is what we call reading day, study day. I've got some meetings in the morning, but I'll be in my office probably late morning until 2, 2.30, 3 o'clock tomorrow. I'll be in my office Wednesday and Thursday from no later than 9 o'clock to 2.30 or 3 o'clock during those days if you want to consult with me and or ask me additional questions via or pertaining to the final exams or the last test. <coughs> Since there is no quote unquote final that is comprehensive, it is just two last tests. But anyway, that's the name of the game for the rest of the week. Comprendez-vous? All right. Some observational things in regard to the play bus stop, just for fun here. What did Bo order for his snack when he arrived at the cafe and went over to the counter? A couple. He wanted how many? Three hamburgers. How? I'm not real sure about that, but that's what he ordered. Along with some potato salad and some ham and eggs and a quart of milk and good God. I'd hate to be back on the bus with him after eating all of that. What was the professor drinking? Yeah, but what kind of liquor? He was ordering lime soda or a lemon lime soda, i.e. something like Sprite. Yeah, but what kind? Don't you remember? The bus driver ordered a ham and cheese on rye. And Grace replied, well, we ain't got no rye. And the professor says, yes, I ordered rye myself and was refused. Rye whiskey. I know y'all drink Mad Dog 2020, so y'all wouldn't know about rye whiskey. 
I don't think they know about Mad Dog. <laughs> they don't know about that. <laughs> oh my God, you could buy it for 99 cents a quart when I was in college. Mm -hmm. But that was a long time ago. Like Boone's Farm, Strawberry Hill. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> We're showing our age and that great that we both share. Uh, what language was uh, Elma studying? What foreign language? Pardon me? How do we know French? She was correcting Cherie's Ozark pronunciation of Shantusi and Shairi and Hildegard. She says, I go by the name of Shairi. That's French, isn't it? I don't know. What I'm getting at here, folks, is that I've been trying to beat this in your head since January. You've got to pay attention. You cannot just sit in a theater. You shouldn't just sit in a theater. You should not sit in a theater mindlessly. You're wasting your money. What does the Mann Act prohibit? M-A-N-N. -N. This is mentioned by the sheriff in the third act. And it's actually a legitimate law. It's on the books nationwide. M-A-N-N, -E -N, the Man Act. Well, it's about transporting over state lines. Yeah, taking right? a woman across state lines without her permission. It's in essence a variation of kidnapping, which is what Bo has done to Cherie. Where did Cherie work? Dear God, Blue Dragon nightclub down by the stockyard, she ever heard of it? Ooh. What did Virgil tell Bo that he needed when he had problems with women? Virgil says you don't smoke, you don't drink, you don't chew. You've got to have some bad habits to fall back on when you have trouble with women. God knows he's right from a male point of view. Who are Hank and Orville? Yeah, Some other cowboys that work on Bo's ranch back in Montana. What did Bo refuse to perform for the uh, floor show in the second act? Rope tricks and reciting the Gettysburg Address. What did Grace say first attracted her to Carl? Pardon me? Big hands. What did Grace say about needing a man every now and again? If she doesn't, she'll get grouchy. Exactly. Keeps her from getting grouchy. Uh, where's the restroom? Yeah, what kind? You got it. How many times has Professor Lyman been married? How many fights has Will Masters lost? Well, let's stop that and get to the, the questions on the back of the handout. I set this first question up, how does the title of the play suggest meaning both literally and symbolically the Friday before we began watching this in the sense that you find these kinds of places, bus stops, 
railway stations and such. And I even referred to it in the reason why the city of Florence even exists in the sense that Florence, for example, it exists because, in part, because we're sitting at the intersection of I-95 and I-20 in terms of north-south travel and east-west travel. Okay, this cafe slash bus stop is at the crossroads of two state highways somewhere out in the middle of nowhere in the Midwest. All right, that takes care of the literal aspect of it. But what's the symbolic implications of this? Oh, good Lord, people. Well, that a lot, a lot of characters are, have a chance to change at this point. Not just Bo, but like other ones can change too. The yeah, professor. practically everybody it, it, it involved was at a crossroads in their lives. Bo makes it very clear that the only reason he's gone to Kansas City and entered that rodeo was so that he could meet what he thought was going to be his future wife. Now, that's a stupid endeavor from the start with, because that's not how you go about it. But he had come to a point in his life where he was ready to settle down. Virgil, in light of the fact that Cherie and Bo do get together, he's now at a crossroads. He can't keep going in the direction he's going. He's got to take a different path in life. The professor, at the very end of the play, before he makes his final exit, he says to, to uh, Elma, you know, where he breaks off their potential meeting in Topeka, Kansas, by saying that it's so gratifying to know that one is doing the right thing, I don't know why I don't choose to do so more often. And in light of the fact that he's in the vicinity of the Menninger Clinic, which exists in reality, it is a hospital where one can go to dry out or get off of other forms of substance abuse. And he talks about, you know, the possibility of stopping there. But he's at a crossroads in his life. He's finally coming to recognize that what he has been doing is not right. Carl and Grace, they're pretty much in dead end lives. He drives that bus to and fro. She goes upstairs, comes back down, day in, day out. Okay, they decide that 20 minutes could be satisfactory for a while, but they're both at a crossroads in their lives. Cherie certainly is. Bo certainly is. The only person I could probably eliminate is, is uh, the sheriff. I mean, Elma, here you've got the opposite of the dumb blonde where she is incredibly smart she's just not very street wise and had no idea what the professor was up to but she comes to an awakening in terms of street sense and what have you that changes her life and the direction of her life so there's more to this whole idea of crossroads than just the physical location of this restaurant slash bus stop Let's go to question four on the handout. What is the significance of the snowstorm, literally and symbolically? I talked about this prior to us viewing this production in the sense that literally it is a device created by the playwright to trap these characters in that cafe for a period of hours so that the relationships could develop and he could develop the theme of the play. But then what is the symbolic implication of it? What is the symbolic implication of that snowstorm? I asked you the very last thing on Friday. What is the last sound that you hear at the end of the play? Wind. The wind howling. Why? 
and it has to do with that question. All right, let me back up even further. What's the color of the interior of that set? Kind of an amber color, which in the world of color analysis, we would call a warm color. Ambers, reds, orange, yellow, those are all warm colors, purple, blue, black, those are all cool colors. What the scenic designer, lighting designer at all are doing is juxtaposing that warm interior with what we see at the beginning of the play as that cool exterior. Not just the effect of snow falling, but the blue wash of light on the backdrop indicating night, cold. So you've got these people coming in out of the cold. You've got these people coming in out of the cold into this, in essence, sanctuary. This is punctuated even more at the end of the play when Virgil is standing there center stage completely alone talking about, well, I guess that's what happens to some people. They get left out in the cold. What the playwright is trying to insinuate here is these people have come in out of that weather into this warm sanctuary, but guess what? Eventually you've got to turn around and go right back out in it. And it's a cold, cruel world out there. Many of you freshmen probably have struggled this year to try to get adjusted to college life. In a couple of more years, you're going to really enjoy college life. You get up, you go to class, you do your thing. You might go to a job for a couple of hours. The rest of the time, you're partying and having a good time. And guess what? Four years later, we're going to parade you across the stage over there in the gym one Saturday morning. We're going to hand you a piece of paper. One of the faculty is going to escort you to an exit door, and we're going to take our foot, and we're going to shove you out that door and go, okay now. Figure it out. Sink or swim. All of a sudden you're kicked out of your comfort zone. Bo talks, I mean Virgil talks about not being willing to leave his comfort zone to fulfill his need for a relationship with a woman. Symbolically that whole process is trying to remind us that yeah we can escape our problems and this and that and the other for a while but eventually we got to turn around and go right back out in it. I mean quite frankly it's been publicized that I'm retiring. For 35 years, I've come into a classroom like this, day in, day out, talk, gotten a decent paycheck. In about a week, I'm going to go, okay, what the hell am I going to do now? This has all become kind of a little sanctuary, daily routine. I know what it is. I can deal with it. Now, one thing about retirement is I won't have to fool with people like you any longer. Thank you, Jesus. But then again, whoo, major cut and pay. My hobbies are expensive. <laughs> Cold, cruel world out there. In relation to this, number five, what line referring to the weather is repeated several times during the opening plate? Are there symbolic implications associated with this line? What was the line? March is coming in like a lion. And again, as I've said before, and we know this already from our own experiences literally in the last, last month, is that what this is referring to is the fact that the month of March is a transitional month. I've already talked about this. The fact that the beginning of March, first two weeks, three weeks of it, we're getting the last blast of winter, but by the end of March, 
we begin to see the first elements of spring, the daffodils, grass current turning green, buds on trees, new leaves. Changes. Comes in like a lion. You don't hear the other part of it. They don't say it in the play, but it goes out like a lamb. This foreshadows something. It has symbolic implications. Referring to whom or what? Bo, of course. He comes rip-roaring in there, flinging the doors open. There's a blizzard going on outside. Puffing and puffing and blowing his ego all over creation. And by the end of the play, we're seeing a guy wrap his, take his coat off and wrap it around Cherie's shoulders before they get back on the bus. Is that the same guy that came in the door? No. Radical changes have taken place within him. Radical. Let me jump to a question I left hanging the other day while I'm talking about Bo and Cherie. What's the name of the song that Cherie sings in the second act? And I use the word sing very loosely. What's the name of that song? Old Black Magic. That old black magic called love. That old black magic called love. Now, why of the hundreds of thousands of love songs did the playwright choose that particular song for her to perform? You stop and look at it in the context of the play. What has just happened previously? Bo is sitting with Virgil, trying to flesh out in his own mind what love is. Cherie has been doing exactly the same thing with Elma over at the counter, trying to figure it out herself. I don't know how many weddings that I've been to where they have referred to the love passage out of the Bible, 2 Corinthians, where it talks about love is this, and love is not that, and love is this, and love is not that. People for centuries have been trying to figure out what it is and how it happens. And what you've got to recognize is what that song says is the truth. It's magical. It just happens. It'll come out of nowhere. It'll surprise you. I've lived long enough to figure this out. You know, Professor Lyman, right after their discussions and before the floor show, steps in speaking to Elma, says how defiantly we pursue love as if it was an inheritance that we must wrangle about with angry relatives in order to get our share. And the, what he's saying here is some people think they are owed it, they are deserved it, that they've done something to win it. And that's not the case. But he talks about maybe man in his existence has become too misery of himself to give of himself in any true relationship. Meaning that maybe we have become so self-protective and self-centered, and I think this is getting worse because of the smartphone. You're going to say, what in the hell has the smartphone got to do with this? Everybody's taking pictures of themselves. What does that make you? Selfish. Self-centered. Where do you think the word comes from? And maybe the professor via the playwright William Inge just correct. We have become so self-centered and so self-protective that we're unable to give of ourselves in any true relationship. I don't know. It's a thought. But the point here is, is that what again the playwright is trying to do is to reinforce this whole idea of the need to risk the danger of intimacy, yet the fear of it, in terms of the theme. Being a little bit random here, 
question eight, what two characters would you designate as father images or father figures and to whom and how? Who do we see in the play that's serving as a father figure? Virgil, obviously, to Bo. And again, we've talked about that extensively in the sense that he is counseling him, you know, giving him advice, trying to straighten him out, trying to straighten out his thinking process. So obviously there's one. Is there another? The sheriff to whom? To Elma? Not to Bo. To Cherie. She goes to him for protection, for advice, and he does both. Protects her, he provides the advice. But there's a moment in the third act when we really see that sort of father-daughter relationship come to full fruition. What is the last thing that the professor says to Cherie before he goes home for the night? Or what's left of it? Professor? Hmm? You said for the I don't professor. mean the professor. Sheriff, what's the, what's the last thing the sheriff says to Cherie before he leaves the stage? Exactly! He turns at the door and looks back at her and says, Montana ain't such a bad place. What is he saying? Yeah. Now that we see Bo as he really is, now that he's gone through the catharsis of that fight, we've managed to strip that macho crap away from him, and we now see him as he is. In fact, Sheree has this funny little line at the end. Isn't it so wonderful when somebody so also turns out to be so nice? And what he is in essence doing subtextually is giving her permission to go on with this. Does anybody else serve as a father figure? When I really have an active thinking group, I'll always have somebody say, well, Professor Lyman to Elma. And of course, my reply to that is, that's incest. Think about it. So no, that one doesn't apply. Uh, question uh, 13, is the relationship between Bo and Cherie believable? Why or why not? Is the relationship between those two people believable? In the end, I don't believe it is at all. I don't believe, well, it's not that they come from different worlds. I don't believe that their relationship is believable. Here's why. I made a kind of a backhanded comment about my own marriage. The fact that I met my wife when we were about eight years old. We were 26 when we got married. So quite a few years had passed by. It took us that long to figure it out. Bo and Cherie, when you look at their concepts of love there early in the first or second act, She's talking about respect and hearing bells ringing and he's talking about having good manners and being tall and strong and being able to read and write. They are miles apart. And three hours later they're together. <laughs> Only in fairy tales does a man and a woman come to grips with reality in that short a period of time. Now, question 22 says, can Bo and Cherie be described, it can be in any way described as a typical couple? Yeah! They're fighting and clawing at each other, trying to figure it all out. But what I'm suggesting, what the previous question is, it happens in too short a period of time. 
It's like these uh, crime dramas on television where someone is mysteriously murdered and then 60 minutes later the murder is solved. Uh Uh-uh. It doesn't happen like that. So there is a little bit of peculiarity there. Question 14, is the relationship between Elm and Professor Lyman believable? Most of you'd go, creepy old man. Ought to be locked up and thrown in jail. But it's okay for a 65-year-old woman to chase a 21-year-old. What's the term we call them nowadays? Cougars? Everybody goes, isn't that cool? You know, that old ghost got her a hot one, you know, a boy toy. Why can't men do it? I don't get it. Pardon me? Well, of course. Any logical person would think so. But, you know, it's funny how our society kind of says, oh, that's okay. And then the other side, oh, oh, pedophile. But no, obviously, their relationship is a little bit weird. It happens. Happens all the time. Let's go to question three. The theme song, the music of the play. You hear it at the beginning, you hear it between the acts, you hear it at the end of the play, and even Virgil performs it on the guitar for the floor show, what becomes the theme song for this particular production, which is a western tune called the Red River Valley. Why in the world is the playwright picked this, and why is it used so often? Well, none of you are old enough to remember back in the early 70s, and they're still hanging around, albeit one of their uh, group members died this past year, but there was a group called the Eagles. Big time popular in the latter years of my college life in the early 70s. They had a song out called Desperado. Linda Ronstadt recorded it a number of years later. Came a big hit for her as well. The play is about two cowboys and about their relationship and about their lives from a ranch in Montana. Again, in terms of mood and atmosphere, what the playwright and the producers of this show is attempting to do is to, through that music, conjure an image in the mind's eye of the audience of this lonesome cowboy out sitting at night around a campfire with nothing to look at but their horse, out riding around alone in the wilderness of the West, herding cattle and so forth. And what it's attempting to do again in terms of Bo and Virgil is to reinforce and to continue to establish this idea of the lonesome cowboy. Which then drops me down to question 23. What is the difference between being lonely and being alone? Or is there a difference between being lonely and being alone? Hmm? Oh, of course there is. And again, because I can empathize and identify with a number of things in this play, I've mentioned several times, I make no bones about it, I like to deer hunt. It's not killing a deer that I enjoy. It's about being in the woods alone. Where I don't have somebody going, yeah, 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 in my ear all the time. The phone's not ringing. Somebody's not crawling my tail about something. I'm out there alone, and I am perfectly happy. But now if I leave the trees, go back home, say years ago when my children were still living under my roof, and my wife, and so on and so forth, and I go home to find an empty house, and I'm there for a couple of days while they're off visiting my in-laws, which is the way it needs to be, me here, them there, that's a whole nother story. Then I'm lonely. I miss those people that mean the most to me. And again, this is something that this play is attempting to explore. 
Grace says at the very beginning of the play, there's a difference between being in love and making love. One is an emotional attachment, the other one is just a physical stimulation. One lasts, one doesn't last. No. Let's go back to question two. God, we're going to run out of time here. Why does Inge locate the setting of the action 30 miles west of Kansas City, Missouri? All right, the play takes place in Grace's Cafe. That's the location of the action to play. Geographically, it's 30 miles west of Kansas City and so forth. All right. Here's the United States. There's Florence. 30 miles west of Kansas City puts us dead center of the United States. You can draw a line from Maine to Southern California and from Washington State down to Key West, Florida. It winds up right there. Why in the world there? What's the significance of this? When you talk about the universality of the United States, you talk about the heartland, the Midwest, state fairs, mom, apple pie, hot dogs, baseball, all of those things that Americans hold dear and universal. Once again, this is a conscious decision by the playwright for two reasons. A minor reason is, is this is where the playwright grew up in the Midwest. He writes about Midwestern themes. But most importantly, what this play is about is the ability to develop a relationship and a meaningful relationship. And this is something that every human being experiences. It is a completely universal theme. The need to risk the danger of intimacy, yet the fear of it. And again, he's pointing up the universality of that concept. All right, before we run out of time, we need to talk about the other part of the exam. I'll leave you with one final thought. What did uh, Carl leave outside of Grace's apartment? His snow boots. That's how the sheriff found out that they were up to uh, some hanky-panky. All right, the other test that you're going to receive refers to the lecture and chapter material leading up from the last exam up until we began watching Bus Stop. We start off talking about the physical theater. I talked about four different kinds of theaters. The proscenium theater, the thrust theater, the arena theater, and what this one is being a flexible theater. I talk more specifically about the proscenium theater because that is the predominant type of staging method that you're going to see or type of theater or stage that you're going to see most often using this one in its current position with the seats facing the stage in terms of proscenium and we talked about some of the various components of the proscenium theater everything from the apron to the wing to the proscenium arch we talked about some of the mechanics of the proscenium stage in terms of the counterweight fly system, things that are suspended from the counterweight fly system such as the uh, grand drape and the legs and the borders and the cyclorama. Then we moved on to scenic design, talking about what the scenic design is attempting to do is to create the correct visual environment for a given play. We talked about the illusion of the fourth wall in terms of a typical box set, which is what you saw for uh, Always a Bridesmaid. And of course, Bus Stop was also on a proscenium stage via a box set. Uh, we talked about some of the scenic designers' process in terms of the different kinds of drawings that they're going to create to build the set from in terms of 
front elevations, rear elevations, rendering, a floor plan. We talked about five basic functions of scenery to aid the actor in communication of the playwright's intent, uh, create an element of decoration to establish where and when, mood and atmosphere, and so forth. Kind of on a side note, we talked about what a flat is, F-L-A-T, that standard unit of scenery that is used to create the walls in a typical box set. I talked about two ways to classify stage settings, be it representational or presentational. Representational sets are the ones that represent an identifiable location. A presentational is one that doesn't do this. Then I moved on to lighting design. Talked about the history and the evolution of lighting. Talked about some basic uh, lighting instruments or fixtures, the ellipsoidal, the Fresnel. Talked about the color media known as gel. Talked about illumination control through dimmer control. Talked about the functions of stage lighting, focus of attention through selective illumination, enhancement of beauty and mood and atmosphere. And then ultimately I talked about what is known as a light plot, which is the lighting designer's plan for the lighting for a particular play in terms of the placement of fixture based on the theories of Stanley McCandless, who developed what we now know as the area method of lighting which is based on 45 degree angles. Then we went on to talk about costume design. Costume designer's main function is to create a costume that communicates information about the character. We talked about the difference between clothes and costumes. The fact that clothes can be costumes with the exception of the fact that they've got to allow for the actor to move, they've got to allow for quick changes, and they have to be far more durable than regular clothing. We talked about establishing the historic time period of what we call period costumes, those that are historically accurate to a given time period in history. And the way that we do that is through establishing the uh, clothing silhouette, again illustrated by way of a handout. Then ultimately we talked about makeup, and I talked about the three most common techniques in makeup, what we call straight makeup, old age, and fantasy makeup. And then I talked about a number of reasons why stage actors like to apply the makeup to themselves in terms of relaxation, and the ability to get into character, and even the need for makeup, and that is to counteract thousands of watts of stage lighting. But that, in essence, is everything I think that I covered in terms of the chapter material. That then leaves us with several minutes. I know most of you want to blow them off and get on to the rain. But again, I'm going to open the floor for questions at this point. In the biblical sense, speak now forever, hold your peace, for there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and wearing of sackcloth and ashes by next week if you don't. Yes, ma'am. Name of the people that we, what? Oh, you talking about Hank and Orville? <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking, you know, scenery, lighting, costumes, and you're talking about Hank and Orville. The reason I didn't understand your question. That's a perfectly fair game as well. All right, here's your one more. What did Bo show off for having won the rodeo? Buckle. Not his belt, belt buckle. That's the trophy you get with a uh, rodeo.
Other questions? It's a long time between now and Friday. but none of it seems to be directed at me. I know what's on the test. I'd ask me. Pardon me? Number four on the handout. What is the significance of the snowstorm? Alright. Again, primarily and literally it is a device created by the playwright to stop the bus so that the passengers are trapped in that cafe so that the action of the play can occur. Symbolically, it is representing the fact that it's a cold, cruel world out there. Just like now. You know, we're all in here dry and safe, and guess what? In about two minutes, you got to get up and go back out there in the middle of that monsoon. Well, these people have come in out of the cold to try to resolve their problems and their life's issues, and some of them do so successfully, i.e. Bo and Cherie. They've got a new life on the horizon. But guess what? They've got to go back out symbolically into the cold. Yes, literally too, because the blizzard's still going on. But again, we're talking symbolically to try to hash out and be able to sustain a life together. Yeah. Um, 23, Lone and Lonely, which characters show that? I mean, I think Sherry... The Sherry, not Sherry. The Sherry, the Sherry. Great. The Sheriff. He's alone, he's lonely, he's, but he's accepting it, he's dealing with it. But then you take somebody like Grace, who is suffering from both. Uh, she's having a hard time handling it. The professor, Virgil, Bo, no. Cherie. They're all trying to figure a way out of the lonely. They're both. But I think for the sheriff, you know, for example, he's fine with it. I mean, it's like the difference between Bo and Virgil. You know, Bo struggling with you know wanting some something more in his life. So is Virgil. He wants more in his life, but Virgil accepts the situation. He gets it. He understands. This is the bed I've made. I got to lie in it. Ergo, what he says at the end of the play. Bo is going to keep scratching and fighting to try to get away from that. And it's a matter of just accepting the way things are or not accepting them the way they are. And this is what I'm getting at. This play is so simplistic on its surface. Boy meet girl, boy girl fight, boy girl resolve fight, boy girl live happily ever after and get on a bus and ride into the sunset or sunrise. There are so many other things going on. This is what gives this play such texture in terms of dramatic literature and makes it a Pulitzer Prize winner. Anything else? Because I know we're a minute or two past. Alright, if you need me this week, you can find me.